It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. Hardy Burt, noted author and correspondent, and Mr. John S. Young, well-known commentator. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable George A. Dondero, United States Congressman from Michigan. Congressman Dondero, welcome to the Chronoscope, sir. <coughs> now, uh, you have been known as a longtime advocate of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which, if it were built, would link the Atlantic Ocean with the Great Lakes. That's correct. Uh, how long have you been battling for the seaway? About 18 years. It's been a controversial matter for that long. And longer. Now, uh, we first would like to ask you, in your opinion, what are the advantages to your state of Michigan and the people of the United States of having this seaway constructed as you would like it? Furnishing uh, cheap cost, water transportation to the ports of the world, uh, making it possible for s iron ore to come to the present uh, steel center in the Pittsburgh area, from which uh, Michigan, and especially the Detroit area, receives its steel for the making of automobiles where we have the automobile capital of the world. The automobile industry is very much for the seaway, I suppose. They are. I see, sir. Well, oh, Mr. Congressman, every president of the United States since Harding has urged the construction of a seaway. Now, is this a new hope or is it still the old dream? I think it's a new hope and now because it's a new approach. Uh, by that, I'd like to have you discuss for me uh, the uh, Senator Wiley's bill, I think, which is the latest legislation before the Congress at the present time on the seaway. Is that right? That's correct. And Would I have introduced the same bill in the House. I think it That's should correct. be pointed out that the Congressman is chairman of the House Committee on Public Works and as such, could be very influential in this legislation and the passage of it. We hope that he is. <laughs> well, would you tell us something about the Wiley Bill? The Wiley Bill and my bill provides uh, for the issuance of $100 million mm -hmm. in revenue bonds to be paid uh, from the tolls charged for the use of the canal. In that way, we will prevent money being taken out of the United States Treasury, and it'll, the canals will be paid for simply by the people who use them same as we charge tolls in the Panama Canal. Now, Congressman, the Canadian government has already said that it would be perfectly willing to pay the cost of building this St. Lawrence Seaway project and has even voiced opposition to the United States coming in on it. Now, why should we, as taxpayers, participate in this project when the Canadian government has come along and said, all right, we'll pay for it all. Why should we spend our money? For two or three reasons. One. If the Canadian government builds its uh, project alone, it will have complete control of the tolls to be charged. We'll have no voice in that. Inasmuch as our commerce will be in larger volume than the Canadian commerce, we'll pay the major portion of the cost of the canal. Whereby, if we participate with Canada, we go in 50-50 and only pay one half. That's one advantage. Secondly, it will be further advantage to control perhaps what is one of the most important waterways on the North American continent. The only outlet of the Great Lakes in the interior of our country to the sea. And furthermore, it will give us something to say in case of war, to have some control over that waterway. I know of no nation on the face of the earth which once held a joint control or full control ever yielded that control to another government. Well, let me ask you this, Congressman. Congress, uh, or rather Canada, doesn't see eye to eye with us on all the phases of this bill. Uh, what are the disagreements uh, between the, the uh, attitude of the United States Congress and Canada? There is no disagreement, excepting that we have been unable to vote out legislation in the United States Congress to join Canada well, in the construction of this work. Therefore, Congressman, I believe there is a disagreement. If for 18 years you haven't been able to get that bill through, I think there is a disaffection between Congress and the Canadian attitude. No, I do not see it that way. The difficulty in our country is the opposition. Well, what uh, is the opposition? Well, let's have that. That's, uh, the opposition uh, <coughs> resolves itself into three categories. First, the Atlantic seaports, and perhaps the Gulf seaports. Second, the coal miners uh, of this country. And thirdly, and the most formidable, the railroads of this country. I think those three groups are the main opposition to the building of the seaway. What well, about the steamship companies? We have no uh, 
great opposition from them, very little. Very little. Now, the railroads have been your chief critics, of course, so far as the seaway is concerned. I think that's Don't they correct. have a pretty valid argument in that this would mean subsidized transportation, competitive transportation against them in the form of ships uh, going up and down there and where part of the cost would be paid by the U.S. government? No, I do not see that it would be a subsidized uh, transportation system against them for the reason that this is being paid for by the people who will use it in the payment of tolls. Therefore, the government is not subsidizing it. Well, it's paid for in the pre first place, as I understand, by uh, bonds, <coughs> small uh, government corporations selling bonds to, to uh, individuals. Is that right? That's correct. But that is, that is supported by the U.S. government. In other words, they guarantee the value of those bonds and the interest they rates do. on them. That's correct. Now, in the Wiley bill, this is unlike the previous legislation, <coughs> where previous legislation has made estimates about $500 million. Is that right? Yes. And under your bill and the Wiley bill, it's now down to $100 million. $100 million. You have divorced the power projects, the hydroelectric projects, from this bill. That's correct. And that's estimated at $500 million alone. Do you feel, then, that there is a reasonable chance, Congressman, because this is very important, is this bill be going to be kept in committee, or are you going to get it on the floor of Congress for a it's vote? My hope that it will be voted out of my committee and to the floor of the House of Representatives where we get a vote on it. We're expecting the Senate to vote first. Now, so you say it's your belief that this is not going to cost the taxpayers of this country uh, uh, very much money. But isn't it true <coughs> that in addition to that $100 million bond issue, that you have to pay for your connecting links in this canal system and if pay for the improvement of your Great Lakes? Uh, if that is desirable in the years to come, due to increased transportation, or use of the canal, where they want deeper channels, yes. And that'll cost about another $100 million. That's the connecting links, or the connecting channels of the Great Lakes. But on, that, on the present basis, can the first line flagships of this nation sail at the 27-foot depth that this canal is projected at? If you mean the, the deep draft vessels, yes. I would say no. But testimony before our committee shows that about 75 and 3 tenths percent of the ships can use the canal. Well, don't you get some opposition to that in which it is said that only about 4% of our first yes, line ships? I've heard that and I think it's a mistake. Well, I, see. I think people with naval training know that, that foreign ships have a shallower draft and they, and they can get into these things much easier than our great ships. Already, I think you'll admit that you have foreign ships already in the, in the uh, lakes up as far as Duluth and Chicago in your own state, haven't you? That is correct, even at Detroit, Michigan. And what they, countries are they? Uh, the Scandinavian countries, Belgium, that's Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and um, even to France, and ships to Italy, one or two to Africa. Now, isn't it another important thing strategically that you are offering a submarine free lane in this new development, the seaway, to take ore from Labrador and bring it into the United States in case of an emergency? That is correct, and in case the ores of this country dwindle to a point where we'll have to get what they call the uh, open pit mine. There are two mine. questions on this issue I'd like to ask you, Congressman. Number one is, it's, isn't it true that if we wanted, if the steel industry wanted to develop its taconite in the mountain ranges out there in the Midwest, that uh, that would be an ample supply of steel ore? If, if you can find money enough to develop the taconite and grind it up, because it takes three tons of taconite ground to the fineness of flour to make one ton of steel. Wouldn't that still that be means a tremendous expense. Wouldn't that still be cheaper than building the St. Lawrence Seaway? It would at not. Cost of hundreds of millions of dollars? It no. would not, because the cost of the seaway is not uh, so expensive as uh, we are led to believe by the opposition. Well, number two, suppose you did have a war. Aren't these locks? Uh, in the St. Lawrence Seaway, very, very much susceptible to bombing from the air. Not any more so than the locks at the Sioux, Michigan, in my state, where one bomb would destroy the entire canal system, bringing the ore from the Masaba range to the steel industry of this country. And about 85% of the ore comes from that area. Mr. Congressman, I'd like to get back to some of the, from my long experience in Washington, some of the practical phases of this. Now, for 18 years, you haven't been able to get this legislation through. If Congress fails to act, can non-federal uh, parts of our United States take on this job, such as the state of New York and the province of Ontario? I think if Congress refuses to, to uh, pass this I legislation... I think not because of the international situation, and no state in the Union has a right to enter an agreement with a foreign country or a foreign government. 
But the state of New York already is proposing the development of hydroelectric energy in cooperation with the province of that Ontario. That will be under a license granted by the Federal Power Commission of the federal government. That's right, and that's before hearing before the Federal Power Commission in Washington right now. That's correct. Well, to sum this up, it looks as if uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, for the first time in its history, has a very good chance of passing Congress this year. Is that correct? Well, I think a greater chance than it has ever had before. But it still has considerable opposition. Yes, it has. Now, uh, there's one final question I would like to ask you, Congressman. Of course, you are chairman of the Committee uh, on Public Works of the U.S. House of Representatives, so you hold a key position uh, in respect to this question that I'm going to ask you. Do you believe that we should have more public power in the United States and less power conducted by private enterprise, as is advocated by a great many Americans? Uh, I believe that uh, we should have all the power we can get developed by private enterprise rather than public power uh, by the federal government because that in my judgment borders on the question of socialism where private enterprise and private investment can do it they should be permitted to do it for after all private enterprise built this country thank you congressman for a very interesting interview the opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own the editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Hardy Burt and Mr. John S. Young. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable George A. Dondero, United States Congressman from Michigan. We're pleased that the Longines Chronoscope is one of the television programs selected by Washington for rebroadcast to our armed forces around the world. And wherever in the free world the Longines Chronoscope may go, it's virtually certain that Longines watches are already there. On the wrists of many members of our armed forces, on the wrists of citizens of these foreign countries, and in the windows of their fine jewelry establishments. Such is the fame of Longines, truly the world's most honored watch. For among the world's finest watches, only Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy from the great government observatories. And Longines watches are sold and serviced in the capitals and major cities of more than 100 countries throughout the world. Now, someday soon, you may wish to purchase for yourself or as an important gift, just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world. Then, you'll choose well to choose Longines, the world's most honored watch. And, unbelievably, you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Wetnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Wetnor Watches. Saturday nights, it's the Stork Club on the CBS television network.